everyone. Uh, delighted to have you back. And uh, those of you joining for the first time, welcome. As you know, we've been running these uh, global virtual seminar series for several weeks, months now. Uh, I am Rina Agarwal, Vice Provost for Faculty at Georgetown University and the Director of the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy. So welcome everyone to the Global Virtual FinTech Seminar Series. Today our speaker is Professor Uday Rajan. Uday is the David Hermelin Professor of Business Administration, Chair and Professor of Finance and Real Estate at the Ross School of Business at University of Michigan. Uday's research interests include the role of credit ratings in the financial markets and on bank regulation, informational frictions, what affects market transactions, and ethical issues with autonomous trading agents. Uh, the recordings for, um, from our previous seminars, they're available on our website. I encourage you to visit our website and uh, get a sense of what we are doing and access the recordings. Please uh, follow us on uh, Twitter at the handle GU Fin Policy. Uh, we're most grateful at the center to our sponsors and partners for making this series and a whole lot of other activities that we do at the center possible. And I want to thank Uday for joining us and I want to thank all of you for joining us. As usual, please raise your hand when you want to ask a question or send it in chat. Professor Alberto Rossi, the Associate Director of the Center, will moderate the questions. Uday has uh, requested that please feel free to ask questions at any point during the seminar. We don't need to wait uh, until the end. And with that, Uday, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. So before I start, I would like to thank Rina and Al Alberto and the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy both for organizing the seminar series, keeping it going through the pandemic, and also, of course, for giving me a chance to present our work. So this paper is joint with Christine Parler and Haushan Ju. Uh, so where this paper starts is with the observation that consumers take part in two important kinds of financial transactions that actually are con con connected with each other. So to start with, let me just tell you what I mean by a con consumer. I'll be using the term consumer a lot throughout the talk. By a consumer, I'm, I'm referring both to a small business, but also to households, also to people like you and me. So you could think of either a small business or people uh, throughout the talk when I use the term consumer. So me as a person, what are some of the financial transactions I take part in? Well, I have loans. I have a mortgage loan on, on uh, my house, or I, have an, uh, I, I might have an auto loan on my car. Another important set of transactions I take part in is the payment system, or more broadly, I both receive payments and make payments to other, other uh, parties in the overall e e economic is, is, is system. So for example, some of the payments I've received, as long as I'm employed, I receive an income from my em, em, employer. And of course, I have monthly payments to make. Or for, well, some of those are paying, uh, making payments in the loans that I've taken, but also various kinds of transactions that I engage in when I purchase the things. If I go to the grocery store and shop, I'm making a payment and so on. So there's loans on the one hand and payments on the other, and in the middle is the consumer who's taking part in both uh, transactions. Now, until if she, uh, now w the important motivating point for our paper is that information on the transactions I'm engaged in on the payment side, so whom I'm getting money in from and whom I'm paying money out to, that can be important in screening me as a consumer uh, to uh, figure out whether I'm credit worthy or not. So in information and transactions, which is contained in the payment side, is useful once we move over to loans. So whoever's making me a loan, be it a, ba uh, be it a bank, be it some other financial firm making me a loan, can, can, can figure out how credit worthy I am. Until about a few years ago, Payments and loans were broadly pretty much bundled within the banking system. So I'll call it a bank, you know. 
uh, 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 for payments. I have my bank account. My income is directly deposited there. At this point in time, goodness, I've completely lost track and I don't even know what the regular or monthly amounts that have been deducted from my bank account are. But I, you know, it's convenient to set it up so that there's these auto, auto, automatic withdrawals every month. So a lot of payments are going from there as well. For loans, probably with the banking system that you used to make loans to both households and to small firms. And therefore, these functions were bundled together. And in this bundled world, if the bank wanted, it was relatively easy for them to process your transaction data and, for, and use that to decide how creditworthy you are. So that was until a few years ago. Now, as you all know, in recent times, there have been big advances in fintech on the payment side. In fact, payments has been among the fastest growing sectors of fintech. And so what's happening is more and more consumers are using fintech firms to handle their payments. Whereas, you know, now fintech firms have started making loans as well. But until very recently, it used to be the case that fintech firms were being used for payments, banks were making loans. I think for the most part, it's still true that fintech firms are more on the payment side than the loan making side, which results in an unbundling of these two functions. And where we come in is it is possible that in this unbundling, there's an information loss at the time somebody wants to make this consumer a loan, that they may not have access to the transaction data that was a value in screening the consumer at the time they make the loan. So this is so where we- I, sorry. Yes. Sorry, Udai, just a question that, so when you're thinking about here, the FinTech payments, you're thinking about Venmo, you're thinking about, uh, what kind of platform? Mm -hmm. So uh, well, credit Indeed. cards here would be still in the traditional banks, right? Indeed. So credit cards, so, so this question comes up a lot and it's been pointed out to us we were able to use credit cards, goodness, uh, 40 years ago people were using credit cards. And, and indeed you could argue that the same unbundling happened if I had my credit card eventually as a at the, at the bottom of the credit card system, there's still banks uh, that were issuing credit cards. If I had my credit card with one bank and then got my mortgage loan from some other bank, the same unbundling had happened. And indeed, this is true. I think one nuance that comes up, and uh, this is uh, tied to the rise of fintech as well, is that today, in, you know, back then, in the non-big data world, the uh, ability to process granular transaction information was also quite uh, quite small. Today, the uh, ability to process this information has grown by vast amounts, and therefore today that information has more value for screening loans than it might have had back then. So tied in with the rise of fintech is the idea that our big data techniques have also gone up. So the you know the hardware capabilities have gone up. Uh, the, the software, the AI has become much better at making predictions, and so these data are more are of more value today than they were back 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 then. So with the so the two two sorts of questions that we ask is. Suppose payments and loans become unbundled and there is an information loss in the sense that data from their transactions cannot be used to screen you uh, when making loans. What effect will this have on bank profit? What effect will it have on consumer welfare? And what effect will it have on the quality of loans made by the bank? Now, that, that's the first part of the paper. Now, in the second part of the paper, of course, we recognize that there are m many advances going on in, to, in the ways in which this data from transactions can actually flow back into the loan making function, including fintech firms making loans, including the fintech firms selling them data to the bank, including if we get to that regime, a world in which the consumer owns their data and the consumer can show it to the bank when they want. So then we say if uh, information can can flow back in these forms, what what uh, effect will it have sorry, again on bank profit, consumer Uday, welfare, and loan loan quality? Would I sorry for interrupting you? I uh -huh. think you there there is a little bit of a noise coming. I think I don't know maybe it's because you're moving or maybe one uh -huh. thing that we can try is that how about if you um take out your headphones and you put just uh, use the speaker of your phone? Maybe actually maybe a better quality. 
Ah, so it 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 uh, <laughs> turns out I'm revealing more of uh, myself as a consumer than what I would like. The solution I'd like to try it out is I'll hold the mic away from my nose oh, yeah, <laughs> a little bit. The the reason being. My cell phone, I I can't hear very well if I don't have the headphones in. So oh, I, I need to be able to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, here on this chart now, again, depending on how large your screen is, you might or might not be able to, be able to read the words. That's less important. I'll tell you what's on this chart. Along the uh, uh, on the uh, in the first row, along the different columns. I had the names of some large big tech firms around the world, from Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and so on. Uh, down the first column, so each row is a different financial function, where my cursor is, the function is payments. And basically, you can see that the row, row is fully filled in, which means that all of these big tech firms are doing something in the payment space. Uh, the second function here is lending and short-term credit. And here, some of these uh, big tech firms have got into lending. Some of them, it says NA, which means they haven't yet got, the, got into the lending, although uh, there is an Apple credit card now. So Apple has certainly got into short-term credit. So my chart is a little bit old. It's from uh, in 2019 before the uh, Apple credit card came out. So this question came up, and you know, as to what exactly I mean by fintech and so on. And so here, indeed, if we think about the U.S., uh, you had mentioned Venmo. Indeed, we're thinking of firms in the U.S. such as Venmo, Apple Pay, or Square, which in the U.S. the form this has been taken is largely they're built in the, the existing banking system, the existing credit card in in infrastructure. So that at the end, end, end of the day, if I'm using PayPal for, to process a lot of my transactions, at the end of the day, the bank might not know exactly whom I'm paying and so on, so granular information might be lost to it. But eventually, my credit card company knows the total amount I'm paying each month. My bank knows my income each month and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, what is in, in interesting is that a second kind of in, in, innovation has pretty much bypassed the banking system. So if you look at Alipay and we, we, WeChat Pay in China uh, or M-Pesa in Kenya, well, these go, you know, bypass the banking system. So for, if you're using Alipay in China, the one, the, the one time you need to use banks is if you need to either withdraw or deposit cash into your Alipay account. Otherwise, once you have money in your Alipay account, all, all transactions are internal to, uh, to the firm and just don't go through the banking system. I'll show you these couple of pictures, then I'll come, come back and talk about M-Pesa in Kenya. So in China now, street vendors, uh, you want to buy something in the street, they flash you a QR code, you scan it with your phone, and the payment gets made. On, on the right of my screen, you can see if you want to give money to a beggar in China, well, they have a QR code, code to, and that might not be through all over China, but the, the point of, of uh, I mean, part of the reason these items make the news is, because these are things that we would not have even perhaps thought of 10 years ago, that we completely bypass cash, not just cash, we got, we got used to the idea of not using cash, but these transactions don't, don't require banks in, in any shape or form. You turn to M-Pesa in Kenya, and you know something like 70% of Kenyan households use M-Pesa. It's become an extremely important device for financial inclusion in regions where people had no access to banks. So this idea that we have new technology that doesn't rely on banks can be used simply on the phone, while more people have mobile phones than have bank accounts in the world, so it becomes a way to include them in the financial system that we didn't have before. And the, uh, the other sort of stat I have on my slide is in 2017, the World Bank had estimated that 1.7 billion people in the world were unbanked. And if it's literally the number of people who have, who you, if I think of that as the number of people who use bank accounts, 
I'm surprised that number is so low. I would have thought it'd been higher, but anyway, <laughs> that 1.7 billion is from a World World Bank report. Okay, so our paper is predicated on the idea. This is just going to be a premise or an assumption in the paper that granular information in your payment data are useful for screening the borrowers. This is an assumption in the paper. So we need to justify this assumption. Do we have any reason to think this assumption is true? Well, the, this idea goes back at least to Fisher Black in 1975. So we have a quote from one of his papers that, look, this, uh, if, uh, if you're using the, if, uh, your, your bank account for most of your receipts and payments, it's clearly going to be a valuable source of credit information on the con con consumer. Now, on the empirical side, this assumption is now backed up with German data, Canadian data, and more recently with data from China. So two papers related to German data, Norden and Weber, show that activity in a bank account is useful to monitor both small firms and households. Now, you might argue, well, monitoring and screening, yeah, in the model we say whether the bank monitors or screens, we can write the model one way or the other. But in practice, in life, these are actually two different functions. So can I back up the screening part? So again, with German data, and this is with the universe of loans made to small consumers in Germany, Sorry, I got muted there for a second. I just got a flash on my screen saying the host had muted me. But so I'm just going to. I hope you can still hear me. If you can't, please uh, let me know. Thank you. Uh, so Puri, Rokol, and Stefan look at a million plus sort of small consumer loans in Germany, a large, large set of data. And at the end of it, they conclude among the most valuable screening devices a bank can have is the following. If the consumer does not have a checking account with you, ask them to open a checking account and watch the checking account for a, for a few months. That's a very valuable screening device. So that again supports the idea that the transactions you engage in can can serve as a, as a can can contain in can contain data that are the, that are of value to the bank. Uh, Mr. Kamura and Renault with Canadian data say that transaction accounts are useful in uh, trying to mo mon monitor firms. And with Chinese data, and this is a recent 2019 paper, how et al. find that Ant Financial, the comparative advantage they have in making loans is the fact that they have access to this massive flow of transaction data. They actually use that to decide who's credit worthy and who's not, and they've been able to profitably make, 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 make loans. So by now, there's a lot of support for this idea that payment data of value in trying to screen boom, boom, borrowers. Okay. So, one last slide before then I go on to the model. And so somewhere I should have sort of mentioned that what we do is we build a theory model and we ask these questions. So soon I'll be sort of bombarding, well, I won't bombard you, but I'll be showing you sort of more details, the model and mathematical expressions and so on. But before we get to that stage, one last point. So in the, in the last part of the paper, we talk about the fact that, you know, these data, these transactions data, can be handled in different ways. You could have the fintech firm sell, sell data to the bank. You could try to set up a regulatory regime as is happening in some parts of Europe where the goal is to try and see if we can find a regime in which consumers own their own data. So consumers have property rights over their data and then, then the consumer can choose whether they want to give it to a third party or not or give it to a bank or, or not. So this uh, on, on the screen right now, what I have is just a map of the world and the regions that are highlighted in red are regions where regulators have been actively trying to think about data policies. Now, the extent to which they're put into place data policies and so on, of course, varies widely even across these red regions. So Europe, I think, has uh, often taken the lead in these matters. So with the GDPR on sort of personal data, and then what's uh, Payment Services Directive 2, 
which requires that banks give access to uh, give fintech firms access to a consumer's account information if the c- c- consumer so would I, chooses. Would I just sorry yes. to interrupt? A uh, question from Rina Agarwal. So, what do you think is the possibility of an open banking initiative to be undertaken in the U.S.? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, I. I this is uh, Rina, in, in this matter, I think uh, your information and your conjectures will be much smarter than mine because you, you're the informed party and I'm not in these matters. <laughs> but if if uh, if I were to speculate, the the U.S. has been behind uh, in this matter. The U.S., I think, in terms of privacy concerns and so on, has been behind on all sorts of data policies. I don't see the U.S. putting in such policies and so on for a few years until they're in place in other parts of the world. And reluctantly, the U.S. says, you know, it looks like other parts of the world are gaining something from these. This is my best guess. But, you know, <laughs> but as I said, in this, I will completely uh, defer to, 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 um, to you. <laughs> Okay, so here are the main results that we find in our theory model. So when, so as I said, we'll start off in a world where we get the complete unbundling. Fintech firms enter the payment services market. Some people choose uh, fintech firms for banking, and others uh, are going with the bank. We find that the effect on consumer welfare can actually be heterogeneous. So this was a little bit surprising to us because you know we all have the in- intuition that uh, so, sorry, competition with raise welfare indeed sorry. i see the raised hand so i will pause thank yeah. you let me unmute Coase. uh Coase, you may speak now go ahead uh, um uday i you know um this is a very interesting take that you have on the paper my own impression was that with the fintech lending and the kind of data they are bringing to credit scoring and other things uh, it's not so much there is loss of information, but you know there is a superset of data being used in lending and things like that. So uh, you know you you seem to say that somehow there is a reduction in the the bank channel. Uh, you know I don't know whether that's a major factor. I think there is the bank channel as it always was, but fintech firms using technology using magic variables to do credit scoring and so on, there is a super set of information coming into play. I don't know what you think about that. In, 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 indeed, one could quite reasonably say that one of the advantages FinTech firms bring to the table is that they have access to different non-payment data about the consumer. So for example, fintech firm uh, see you know either apple or google uh, depending on which cell phone you use can track your cell phone use in ways that a bank cannot and can learn things through your social networks and so on that a bank cannot indeed well, well, it would in fact i actually believe that today fintech firms have particular sets of data the bank does not have access to and are also better able to process that data in banks our paper is going to say, let's take the non-payment information environment as given, in particular to isolate this channel that's coming in through your transactions data alone. Now, this doesn't mean that transactions data have no value. The fact that fintech firms have non-payment data doesn't mean payment data have no value. So we want to isolate the effect of this uh, uh, the data from payments channel. To isolate that effect, we'll keep the non-payment information environment as given. And in fact, what I'm going to be doing in the paper is I'm going to be assuming that banks and fintech firms have the same access to non-payment information and have the same uh, ability to process non-payment in, 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 in information. We actually thought of an extension to the model where we said the advantage of fintech firms is that they have access to different data from banks and superior data in many ways. Banks have on the flip side banks potentially have an a, a, either an advantage or a disadvantage in making loans depending on how you look at it banks are subject to regulation so capital regulation might make capital more expensive for banks on the other hand banks might have a bailout guarantee 
which might mean that they 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 have cheaper access to capital than fintech firms. But all of that seems removed from this one point we wanted to make of data and payments is of uh, value and what 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 happens if that data is not being being used. Thank you. So, so as I was saying, so we find that the effect on consumer welfare can be heterogeneous. Some consumers benefit and other consumers get hurt. So initially, this was a surprise to us because we thought, well, it's got to be obvious that uh, if you have competition that raises the welfare of the consumer, it turns out it's more nuanced than it seems. And when I, you know, when I get there, I'll point out the nuance. I'm using the term on the slide, bankophobes and bankophiles. The terms pretty much on this slide mean exactly what you think they mean. Bankophobes are people who don't like banks. <laughs> bankophiles are people who like banks. I'll be much more precise on this term in a few slides when I need to. Mm -hmm. Of course, when uh, uh, fintech firms compete and payments, banks profit will fall. This, this, okay. The competition hasn't got that far that it makes the rival's profit go up. Or it, you know, so bank profit falls. The quality of loans issued by the bank goes down as a result of this loss in in, in information. What that means is that the regulator may face a trade-off. Consumer welfare on the whole may go up. I'm just telling you it's heterogeneous. Some people benefit, some people may be hurt. On the whole, we might take an ag aggregate measure and conclude one effect dominates the other, it goes up. If consumer, even if consumer welfare is going up, it's possible the banks are now are sitting in a portfolio of more risky loans. And so the banking system as a whole might become a, le become a little bit less is, is, is stable. If payment information flows flows uh, flows back, uh, what what uh, we find is that uh, loan quality, of course, improves because this payment information is now being used again. The bank profit and consumer welfare may either go up or go down. And again, I'll be more precise on under what cases either one of these effects happen. So their the policy conclusions become a little bit in 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 big in US. One interesting thing I'll point out is that even a world in which consumers own their own data might not achieve the welfare policy goals regulators have in mind. There's an unraveling effect whereby consumers at the end might end up being hurt. So I talked about some of the literature in particular on the first bullet point I mentioned, the literature that justifies our motivating assumption uh, this other literature, in the interest of time, I won't talk about these papers in detail. I'll just flag them for you. For you and uh, uh, a few of them I actually will uh, um, come to a little bit later. Uh, yes, indeed. Uday, we have another Go question ahead. from uh, Coase. Go ahead, Coase. Yes, uh, please. Uday, um, so uh, this is a very interesting issue. That is uh, the, the interaction between regulation and welfare. So my... My impression, and a lot of people probably agree with me, is that the fintech lenders, you know, they do non-collateralized lending. They're able to do, they're able to make loans to people who would not otherwise get a loan. In other words, they are increasing, they are increasing access to finance of many of mm -hmm. your consumers who would not really get, uh, you know, a loan. For example, even if you are a great restaurant restaurant chef, you cannot possibly get a loan from a bank. However, some fintech lenders may give you a loan. Mm -hmm. So in that, you know, that's kind of a, uh, it depends on what you think. Are the loans remaining the same or are you going to make a broader set yeah. of loans, which of course has its own welfare yeah. effects as you can see. No, uh, no and this is a really important point. I mean, f financial inclusion is among uh, the biggest welfare ed ed uh, one, one, one advantages of fintech is the fact that more people are being included in the financial system. So, of course, you're pointing out that the inclusion is happening on the side of the loans as well. And indeed, to the extent that fintech firms have access to different data from banks, that will be happening. In our paper, we have financial inclusion going on. And that's going to be happening on the side of the um, payments. So think of sort of M, M Pesa in Kenya, massive financial inclusion happening on the payment side because of the use of uh, fin, uh, mobile, mobile uh, bank. 
fintech. So I, so, so, so I think one way to think about our paper on the loan side is we try to level the playing field between the bank and the fintech firm. To the extent the fintech firm is bringing in some, uh, if I, you know, some superior technology that the bank doesn't have, it's clear that there's going to be a welfare and and uh, and hand, hand, hand sing if, if effect there. So so that's clear. And we're pointing out even if we assume that that effect is not there, there are these other 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 sort of uh, welfare if 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 effects to be kept in mind. Thank you. Okay, so let, let's go to the model. So in in the model, we're going to have one bank. When I say bank, it's it's a representative of the banking system. Probably think of it as either a bank or a credit card firm. This bank is going to be doing providing both kinds of services that I talked about: payment services for consumers, where they can both receive and make payments, and it's going to be providing loans. We're going to have two identical fintech firms. And when I use the label fintech, you could think of independent fintech firms such as Square and Venmo. You could think about big tech firms getting into the payment space. You could think even of sort of on, on, online banks which are getting into the space. In our base model, we're going to shut off the ability of the fintech firms to make loans. So some of the questions you've raised, course, won't come up in the base model. We'll say in the base model, the fintech firm is only offering payment services to con consumers. And we're going to assume, which is a, it's clearly a stretch at this point of time, but you know, you think five, seven years down the road, there's nothing stopping banks from buying fintech firms that have the better tech, 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 no, 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 technology. So we're going to assume that the quality of the app or the quality of the payment services is the same across banks and fintech firms. Today, you could argue, well, a good reason why so many people are using fintech firms is because the technology is superior. It's so much easier to use than the bank. But again, a few years down the road, we expect that to be leveled off because the banks are not going to... <laughs> I was going to make the joke that banks are not going to use cobalt so much forever, but I recently read that banks have uh, banks have a need of, <laughs> of uh, cobalt so much. So, so maybe the jury is out of that. And then the third component of our model is we're going to have a continuum of con con consumers in the model. Okay. So the consumers, there's actually a lot going on with consumers in the model, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time trying to talk through the various aspects of the slide. Uh, I'll show you a timeline on the next slide, but here are the two, you know, two points of time that matter. Time one, you as a consumer, you have to decide, am I going to use a bank to process my payments, or am I going to use a fintech firm? We're going to assume you get some utility from il, il, il electronic payment services. That's the same across all consumers. So just some number of you know, there's a reason why why we're doing this rather than transacting in cash is because uh, uh, because we obtain some u utility from this. The three parameters that are in blue on my slide are the important ones. So the first one we'll call it a bank affinity. This is how much does the consumer like the bank. Now, I'll, uh, I don't need it for a few slides, so I'll be coming back to bank affinity in about five or six slides, and there I'll talk in detail about what we have in mind about where it comes from, for whom it's high, for whom it's low. For now, just think it could be high or low. There's some dis distribution for convenience to avoid corner points. We assume it could range from negative infinity to plus infinity. That's more of a, the, the range is more for convenience as opposed to anything needed. Importantly, it's heterogeneous, it could be high or low. You could think of it as the value for other bank services that we don't uh, model, uh, uh, that we don't formally put in the model. So the bank affinity is going to be one aspect of a consumer that matters. Then at time two, with some probability a consumer will need a loan, we'll fix the size of the loan to be a dollar. So the, there are no small or large consumers in this model, they're all, all the same in terms of size. In our base model, only the bank is making loans. If I need a loan, then two other uh, parameters become important, which are also heterogeneous across consumers. One is, well, how creditworthy am I? This is my repayment probability theta. The other is consumers are going to be heterogeneous on the interest rate they're willing to accept from the bank. So we'll call that the reservation interest rate R. 
in principle, R could represent from how good are you as a consumer at searching for better deals. In, so in principle, it could represent sort of, uh, the, the fact that you might have access to loans from other financing sources and banks, even though we don't model those uh, other, uh, other banks, and we don't model the search process in any way. But one way to sort of obtain some comfort with the fact that we only have one bank is to think, well, we are relying on this um, literature that says there's some st stickiness uh, when uh, firms, firms especially borrow from banks. If the bank cuts off your relationship, well, there could be adverse selection for future banks and so on. And so there might be local mon mon monopoly effects. And if there's real Sorry, competition out there, just... that will reduce, your, uh, reduce the rate of interest you're willing to take. Would I just a quick question from the audience from uh, Saheed is asking, does uh, a consumer consider the risk in making the decision? So the consumer will be take, so the consumer at the time they choose whether to uh, go with a bank or a fintech firm don't really know how how events will play out in the future for them. So you think of it, you know, at, uh, the consumer chooses a bank at some point of time. At some point in time, in a year or two, it becomes a bit sticky. It's uh, you know, there's some amount of inertia builds up. It's not so easy. Today, if you ask me to switch my bank account, goodness, in the online age, it should be a matter of minutes. But it's practically, in practice, it's going to be a matter of several hours while I chase down all the automatic payments that are happening and find the passwords for whatever sites that I don't <laughs> remember and so on. And so there's a stickiness at that point of time. Well, after I've done that in the future, I might have an employment shock or something. So I don't know whether when I need the loan, whether I'll be highly credit worthy or I'll, I'll have a low uh, credit worthiness. And so at time one, I do take into account that in the future, I might need a loan. But I don't really know what state of the world I'll be in at that point point of time. And uh, and then just to finish the slide, one ex one extremely important simplifying assumption we're going to make throughout is that these three parameters, the bank affinity, the your credit worthiness, and your reservation rate are going to be independent of each other. That simplifies the technical aspects of the paper tremendously. It's not an assumption that we're thrilled with, so I think uh, to justify it, I would only say it makes it more convenient for us to show the results that we have. In practice, we expect some degree of correlation across these three. Okay, here's the timeline. At time one, you know your bank affinity, you choose your payment service provider, Time two, maybe you need a loan. If you don't need a loan, well, the model ends at that point. There's nothing much more for us to say. <laughs> if you if you do need a loan, you learn how credit worthy you are. That's your theta. You learn what interest rate you're willing to accept in the bank loan. The bank will then choose an interest rate in the loan, and I'll be very precise about what the bank knows about you in the, on the next slide or two. And then at time three, you default to repay, and the bank gets its payoff. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's start the analysis at time two. Usually, you know, it's a little simple so sort of two date model, if you wish, two, two dates at which any interesting events are happening. So let's start, do backward induction and start at time two. Suppose the consumer needs a loan. Well, there are only two possibilities. Either uh, you as a consumer, you uh, already had chosen the bank to process payments. In this case, we're gonna make the assumption the bank is able to uh, mine or harvest the data from your transactions, and they're fully informed about your repayment probability. The other alternative is you had chosen a fintech firm to process payments. Here we'll say the bank has no access to your transaction data, and I'm going to use the label the bank is uninformed about data. Uh, let's be very careful here. Uninformed does not mean the bank knows nothing at all. It does not mean that at all. It just means the bank is stuck with whatever I call the prior distribution of a theta, but I didn't tell you where the prior came from. The prior could be based on any information the bank can acquire about the consumer other than transactions data. 
So need be the bank can ask for your for the for your annual tax statements. The bank can ask for your annual W two and your sort of, uh, information on your income and so on, information on your expenses. It can get all that. If it has access to social media information, it can harvest that, uses all of that, and comes up with the prior G. But it cannot push to that you know that final step if you wish and and mine your transactions data to refine this prior. So the bank, and this is where having a single bank in the model makes your life a little bit easier, the bank just makes it a take it or leave it offer to the consumer at some interest rate or B. Well, this consumer, the bank has no information on the reservation rate of the consumer because R, remember, is independent of theta. So the consumer accepts this uh, offer if the, uh, if if the uh, reservation rate is higher than what the bank offered, and they reject the offer otherwise. So if I really think I, I have a loan from somewhere else at 5% and the bank offers me a loan at 8%, well, I reject it. If my outside offer is at 10%, then of course I will ac 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 accept the, uh, the, the loan. Okay, oops, I might have, yeah, uh, okay. So let's think about what interest rate the bank will want to charge, and we'll not normalize the bank's cost of funds to zero. That is, uh, Udai, cost sorry. of capital is zero. Yes. S sorry, uh, so we have a question from uh, Suresh. He's saying, fintech lending, know your customer, is recently being focused on the use of the loan instead of the credit worthiness. This makes loan easily available to a bank consumer with less stringent process and cost. How does this model capture this fact? Right. So, so two things. So it'll capture this only in part. So in part, where we'll capture it is in the second part of the paper. We actually look at a regime in which in which fintech firms can make loans, and indeed we'll find that if you chose a fintech firm for processing payments, you 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 will uh, the fintech firm is also the one who will offer you the best rate of in interest. What we don't do, and this is also related to the question Coles had said before, we don't assume that the fintech firm has superior in, 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 in information to what the bank has. So we don't model this aspect that the fintech firms can make loans to some consumers that the bank is not willing to make loans to. I guess, uh, now that I think about it, one way we could capture this is by saying that these consumers have a very low reservation rate and the fintech firm is being able to meet that reservation rate because there's superior information. The bank is not because they don't have that information. So to some extent, implicitly it comes in in the part of the model where we talk about the fintech firm making loans. Okay, so let's go back to the bank's problem. It's trying to choose an interest rate for this consumer. It's choosing what interest rate to offer, where my cursor is right now, I'll be. If the bank is informed, the bank knows the consumer type. So if, you know, one minus H of RB is the probability the consumer accepts a loan, otherwise uh, the consumer rejects the loan. If the consumer accepts the loan, then the bank, bank gets repaid one plus the interest rate with the probability theta. Either, and with probability one minus theta, we assume the bank has prepaid zero, so that term is missing in my e equation. And, uh, and of course, the cost of funds is zero, so the profit it has, so I just subtract the amount of capital it length, which is the dollar. And the details don't matter here, but you know, it's a fairly straightforward equation. We can write down the first order condition, we can juggle with it. The first order condition can be written in this form, where the interest rate offered by the bank, an informed bank, that's the sub i, the i subscript I have here, is the break even rate at which the bank would earn a zero profit, plus a term that we can call the markup. Notice this is an implicit equation because I have r on both sides, so don't think of this as some sort of closed form. But I can think of it as here's uh, the competitive interest rate where the bank earns zero profit, and then there's a markup which comes from the fact that it's a, uh, it's a single bank. And if the bank is uninformed, I get a very similar e equation, except I get the expectation of theta because I don't know it's, it's, it's theta. So a 
couple of uh, actually I, I only have about 50 less than 15 minutes here so uh, let me do the following rather than walk you through the details of the of the of uh, the, the model itself I'm going to jump to some of the propositions and the intuition for them the details are in the paper and so I will, if anybody is more interested in talking about that, send me an email and we'll find some uh, time, to, time to talk through those. So uh, let me highlight one uh, important, we are going to talk of consumer surplus. So I've got to tell you what consumer surplus means. We're going to assume when the, the consumer earns a surplus, if they repay the loan, which is the difference between their reservation rate R and the loan that the, and the interest rate the bank offered. In the model, we assume the consumer earns zero surplus if they default. Now, this is an assumption one can go both ways. One could also say, hey, if the bank gives me a loan today, I use the loan for some purpose today, and you know, if it's uh, if I, I could be a consumption loan of some kind, well, I still obtain my surplus because I consume more than the I could have without the loan. And tomorrow, if I default, well, you can't take the surplus away from me. So you you should say anytime the consumer gets the loan, they earn a surplus. It turns out our results qualitatively do not depend upon this assumption at all. It just makes the proofs a little easier, so we make it. When we think about consumer surplus, we think about it before the consumer knows their own prepayment probability. Why is that? Well, you could argue within the model, we could say, well, we have set it up so the, at the, you know, the, the consumer, when they choose a payment processor, don't know what the theta type will be. So they have to take an ex 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 expectation over this and choose their theta type. That would be what I consider to be the somewhat cheap answer. The better answer would be, think of this from the point of view of a regulator. You as the consumer, you, you, you know your own credit worthiness and so on. You take that into account in, uh, in uh, choosing what you do. The regulator has to care about all consumers. So the regulator has to take an average of all consumers. And so this is the sort of expression a regulator will look at. We have a technical condition on convexity and so on. I'll skip that. I'll go straight to, to our first result on consumer, on, uh, con consumer surplus. And, you know, under some conditions, so I will, the details of the conditions we'll have to, I'll have to skip, but under some conditions, expected surplus from a bank loan is greater if the bank is informed about the consumer's repayment type. Okay. I'll only say here these conditions, anytime somebody tells me in a theater paper under some conditions, I always worry about how weird are those conditions you had to come up with. I'll say these conditions are satisfied if the reservation interest rate has a uniform dis dis distribution. So the most obvious example you would think of writing down, it's satisfied if it has an exponential dis dis distribution and a few others that we looked at. So I don't think of these conditions as weird. What is the import of the proposition? Before you knew your prepayment type, you as a consumer would be willing to sign a contract with the bank saying, I'll give you access to my information at the time that I need a loan. Because your consumer surplus goes up. If, if this, uh, if this uh, technical condition is met. And if that condition is, is violated, then your consumer surplus goes down, and ex ante, you would not be willing to give up your information to the bank. Here was a figure trying to explain this. So the figure we you know, we have in a 1989 paper by Julo and Roberts, which connected sort of the auction theory problem to a mon 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 monopolist trying to choose the price. So let's let, let's look at the top of the left, and I'll go to the one on the right. The solid blue line is the demand function faced by the bank. We drew the figure assuming that the reservation interest rate has a uniform di distribution. Under that, you know, simple assumption, at least for playing around with examples, a very natural assumption, the demand function is actually linear. This is, uh, the bank is choosing a rate, so it's choosing a price along this axis. And the quantity is, what is the probability the consumer will, will accept the loan? 
And so the bank chooses a rate. Anybody with a higher uh, uh, reservation rate will accept the loan. Anybody with a lower reservation rate will reject. So if the bank chose a rate, were well, uninformed and chose a rate on the star, you can read off, well, here's the quantity of people who will accept the loan. And the, and the way you read that off is indeed you can draw a marginal revenue curve from a demand curve. The marginal cost is, you know, because there's zero cost of funds, you can think of a marginal cost and uh, 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 the quantity. What's important about this is we all know what consumer surplus looks like in a demand graph. It's the area ab 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 above the price point and below the demand curve. Is that really flying does there? So the consumer surplus, I'm calling it intermediate, is because this is in a, in a world in which the consumer earns the surplus when they get the loan. We move to a bank is informed, and suppose there are two types of consumers, one of which is a high creditworthiness, so they get a low rate and a large quantity, which is a low creditworthiness, so they get a high rate. And let's assume these have equal prob probabilities. Well, the consumer surplus calculation becomes, on the consumers who have a high credit, I gain this area B. The consumers, uh, sorry, the consumers have high credit worthiness and therefore a low interest rate, I gain this area B. The consumers with low credit worthiness, well, they get a higher interest rate RL, so I lose this area A. This figure was drawn to exact numbers, so it doesn't communicate the following that well. I, you know, I, maybe I should have just drawn a schematic figure. That the height, RL minus R, it was actually bigger than R U minus R H, so it's not obvious to compare the reach B. Turns out, under the condition we specify in the paper for a uniform distribution, so on, it's always the case that B will be bigger than A. So ex ante, given the choice of the consumer saying, you know, half the time I'll benefit a lot, half the time I'll lose a little bit less, I, I, my consumer surplus on average goes up. Okay, the second part, banks, the bank's profit from uh, lending. Well, of course, the bank's profit from lending is higher when it's informed compared to un uninformed. That's in, in immediate. I don't have uh, anything to, more to say about that. The loan quality distribution is superior when the bank is informed than when it's uninformed. That's also not a su surprising result. I'm going to, uh, yeah, I should talk about bankophiles and bankophobes and, and, and then I'll continue. So the outcomes in the payment services market depend on uh, on this distribution of bank affinity. People with a high bank affinity will go to the bank. People with a low bank affinity will go to the fintech firm. We expect this to vary both across and within countries. Within the country, we think, well, high, uh, high, high being consumers, the ones I'm calling the bank of files, these are people who have high switching costs, they value things like uh, uh, um, direct bank transfers and, and so on, banks, uh, direct bank transfers for high value amounts. So these are likely to be older, likely to be wealthier, likely to be less tech savvy. Low B consumers, bankophobes are likely to be younger, tech savvy, better ed ed educated. Uh, this graphic is from an American Banking Association survey on millennials. I don't know how you post this question in the survey, but they claimed in the survey so over 70% of millennials would rather go to the dentist than listen to what the bank is saying. <laughs> and so, <laughs> uh, you know, now once you go across countries, we think, well, bank affinity is likely higher in developed economies, likely lo uh, lower in developing economies. I'm going to skip some technical details, uh, you know, the way we solve for pricing and so on. I'll show you our main exercise. When the bank competes with fintech payments uh, providers, the bank's market share decreases, the bank's profit is lower, the bank's price for payment services can be lower or higher. This is the point where, this is a point that's been raised in the I.O. literature that competition can sometimes raise prices. The intuition is the market is segmented. Fintech firms come in, the people with low Bs, well, they're going off to the fintech firm. The people with high bank affinity, in a manner of speaking, are captive with the bank. 
and the bank might decide that rather than reduce my price and trying to compete aggressively with fintech firms who anyway is going to get these consumers that don't like banks, I'm going to stick to my cash flow market and raise my price on the bank. Now, we all use bank accounts. So I should tell you what I mean by the price here. You might say, you know, I've had the reaction, hey, I don't pay anything for using my bank account. No, the answer is I'm sorry. We all actually do pay for using our bank account in several ways. One is if you don't have min um, minimum amount in your uh, account and that threshold varies from bank to bank, then there are explicit monthly fees. The other is if you do have that minimum account, well, of course, there's a gap between the lending and the rate and the deposit rate. So the bank is paying you less than they're earning by lending out your money, and that's effectively the price that I'm paying. Okay. So, uh, so the, the, uh, one of the main results in this section is the bank's price for payment services can go up. What that implies is if I think about consumer welfare, so here is bank affinity value. The people with low values go to the fintech firm. The people with high values go to the bank. Well, the people who get included by fintech firms in the financial system are clearly better off. They're clearly better off because they were included. The people who stick with the bank can end up being worse off because the bank's price goes and go up. And the people who switch from the bank to the fintech firm can be, can be worse off because their preservation utility goes down. So the welfare effects are nuanced and heterogeneous and depend on the bank affinity value. So two minutes left. Uh, we can, uh, sorry, I didn't talk about loan quality, but clearly so, so, so the distribution of loan, loan quality becomes worse for the bank. And let me just talk very quickly about three cases. I'll show you one table and then I'll conclude. So we look at three data regimes. One is where fintech firms can make loans. One is fintech firms sell data. And the third is the consumers themselves can transfer their data to the bank. When fintech firms can make loans, bank profit clearly goes down. Consumer welfare, it depends. That if you're the fintech consumer, great. This is an excellent world for you and you're better off. If you're, the ba if you're sick with the bank, you might end up being worse off. In all regimes, loan, the quality of loans in the economy is good because this information from transactions is again being uh, captured. I, I, I want to say a word about data port port portability because this is some movement, you know, there's some movement to us saying that, well, consumers should have property rights over that data. We find in our model that if you give consumers the option to share data, what will happen is if you're the most credit worthy consumer, you immediately send in your data. Well, what that means is unraveling occurs. The next most credit worthy consumer has to keep doing it and so on. This is like we tell our MBA students, well, you should be talking about your grades. And in fact, we have a rule at uh, Michigan here, they're not supposed to reveal their grades. And the ones who are doing really well somehow manage to find a way to signal it to employers anyhow. And so the un unraveling occurs. If you'd rather that the bank not know your information ex ante, you might end up in a situation where all consumers are worse off. Okay, I am out of time, so I just put up my con con conclusion slide here. We, you know, our, our motivating assumption is pay, the transactions, data, and payments is, is useful for screening borrowers. In terms of consumer welfare, we find that people who, uh, who are very quick to uh, adopt fintech and find it easier benefit. People who stick with banks and are old-fashioned people like me, I suppose, might, might, be, might be hurt. The a regulator might be concerned about the fact that the bank profit falls, that the charge of value, that might increase the desire of banks to take risk on other dimensions, which we don't model, but that's a factor to keep in mind, the quality of bank uh, and the quality of bank loans as well. So thank you. I would end here, and thank you so much for coming and taking part. Thank you again to the Center for hosting this seminar, and thank you for all your um, comments. Thank you so much for that. It was uh, fantastic. Uh, unless we have uh, anybody, any other questions? Oh, yeah, so maybe we have one last question before we can let you go. So Suresh is asking, can we explain loans quality from social and commercial value perspective? 
so the, the the social value we can so again it depends on what you have into what you have in mind in terms of social value it it, it matters for both social value and commercial values so let's talk about uh, commercial value suppose the bank were to sell the loans which bank will try to package portfolios of loans and sell them off as clos and so on well in valuing the loans i want to know what the credit worthiness of these people is and so to try to estimate the credit worthiness of the borrowers of the loan it i should know what the bank knew about these loans before they had made them before i can fully un, un, understand with the credit worthiness when i when i think about social value of loans i'm thinking of it from the viewpoint of a, a, a regulator i mean there are many aspects to social value but the one that we focus on here is well how stable is the bank is the banking system if the banking system breaks down again we are in, in some sort of 2008 or 9 financial crisis where there's tremendous loss of social value from possible npp projects that don't get taken and so on and and so forth so a regulator trying to assess the riskiness of banks again is has to try and infer what a bank knew about the consumer before they made the loan right so part of the basic regulations are the amount of capital you hold has to depend on the bank's estimate of the probability of default and so on well if the bank's information is becoming worse i can't rely on the bank's old models to try and figure out what the likelihood of default is perfect thank you so much so let me take uh, this moment for thank once again uh, udai for the great preparation presentation make sure to check our website and follow us on twitter at uh, gu fin policy and next week we're going to have another great paper from tarun ramadorai and the title is predictably unequal the effects of machine learning on credit markets so we hope to see you there next week and thank you so much for connecting